York, man. Yeah, I'm sorry, man. I'm in the car. You know what I'm saying? We just had a meeting, and um, you know, I'm I'm uh uh headed headed back to the crib. You know, but I didn't want to be late. You know what I'm saying? I didn't want to be on that CPT time. So, ah, <laughs> my man, my man. Hold on one second. All right. All right. Yeah, that's what's up, man. So first of all, thank you, man. It's been a while since we even had a conversation. What's been a while? Yeah. How you been? Yep, yeah, man. Just you know, trying to huh? stay busy, trying to stay active. You know, trying to trying to keep it moving. You know me, man. I'm always busy. Doing man, you something. got your hands in a lot of stuff, man. Hey, listen, I've been trying to, you know, I've been trying to fluff you up a little bit. You know what I mean? Give him the give you the smooth introduction. You know, but I said, man, you know what? Let me let me let him tell you everything because I can't I, I can't even remember all the stuff you done done. Man, I mean, I first of all, oh, I wanna. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I yeah. remember all of it, man. I'm telling you. Uh, so we know you a, we know you a, a New York native, man. So uh, how'd you end up in Atlanta? Let's man, start there. How you end up in Atlanta? I, I came down here to a, to Atlanta to attend school, man, and study computers. And, really? Um, yeah. You know, and 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 you know, got got caught up in in the music thing. Okay. You know, and I've been with that ever since. So how did you get it? How you transition into music? From I mean, computer, from the computer field and to the engineering to the. It's funny. Huh? Like um, one of my one of my classmates, right, was uh, played bass in a local band, and um, they needed help moving equipment one night. You know what I'm saying, and mm -hmm. um, they asked me if, if you know, if I was if I was down. You know, I, I'm a uh, I'm a music lover and I love live music, so you know, I, I I went ahead and did it. You know, and and that night, that one night changed my whole life. You know, after so we, um, uh, you know, I, I, we were at we were opening up for this band, How Melvin and the Blue Notes. I know a lot of people, a lot of youngins don't know okay. who they were. Okay, okay, you know. They were doing their thing back back in that in those days, and um, you know I, I just fell in love with with the atmosphere, with being behind the scenes, and I decided you know at that point to make it my career. So, so you got to remind people, man, because we in twenty twenty four, man. What year was this? Uh, this was in nineteen eighty five, oh. man. Okay, I, so I, this I, was in the eighties. Yes. Yeah, so. Your grind in the 80s was completely different than what it is today. I mean, a lot of people, man, are like, well, hell, how did they, you know, if you didn't have a cell phone, how did you contact people? You want no computers. I mean, how you hit the ground running, how you meet these people, how you get in the door, how you do X, Y, and Z? How that happen for you? Man, I, listen, I networked my ass off, you know, network going out, you know, back then, you know, we couldn't do it in the box. We had to go out physically. And, and network with people, you know. We had to go to functions. We had to go to Jack the Rapper and all the other um, music-related functions here. And, you know, I just made it a, a point to yeah. make myself known in the business, you know, you know, uh, uh, surrounding myself with talented people. I can't say that they were the right people because nobody was on yet. I just wanted to be around talented people. You know, and some, yeah. some of those talented people ended up being like Jermaine Dupree, Dallas Austin, um, uh, Rico Wade and uh, Patrick and, and uh, Ray Murray from Organized Noise. You know, I just put myself in with the right folks. You know? And all of this, and all this was at a time before they were stars, before they were who they were, right? Exactly. Everybody was just grinding, trying to make it, trying to find their way. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, so what was your, your first big break? Oh uh, when did you my, when did you get into doing say, man, you know what? Sorry to cut you off, but when did you when did you get it? I mean, because everybody grinds and before you make it, you get that that feeling like, damn, I think we own or something. What moment was that? Uh, when I was managing arrested development. Back okay. In the late 80s. Arrested you know development. Yep. You know they had that song. Uh, Take me to 
to another place. Take me to another. Hey, that's my favorite song, my dear, to be honest with you. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Um, they, uh, uh, they, they took me there. And then before that was meeting Jermaine Dupri when he was producing a group called Silk Times Leather. And then, you know, uh, by, by working with him, you know, I got to meet his father. And uh, what I did was at the time, uh, I, I, you know, was just learning management. I took uh, rest of development as far as I could go. So I ended up giving uh, management over to uh, Michael Malden, Jermaine Dupree's father. And he ended up giving, getting me a job uh, with this company, Ichiban Records, um, okay. running their hip hop department. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, that's when I went out. That was my first full time job with the actual paycheck in the business. So, what did you see in uh, Arrested Development before they were different. that made you say they were, they were, they were different. different? I always gravitated toward different things. You know, things that, Some that the, the norm stood out. Had. Yeah, they stood out because in that time, you know, it was you dealing with um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, booty shake music, from okay, Florida, Uncle Luke, and things like that. And you know, uh, Arrested Development was all on this Afrocentric tip, you know. Mm. And, and um, you know, I I just enjoyed that whole that whole movement, man. You know, um, and I was able to move it to a certain degree, you know, and um. Yeah, that that's it. You know, it was just working with um, working with something that was different. Man, a guy from New York, man, coming down. You know, at that time, you know, the New York sound had a unique type of sound. You know, you talking about the LLs, you talking about the Big Daddy Kings. You know, you talking about the EPMDs. You know, you talking about the Salt Peppers. Yeah. You know, you 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 talking about that. So, for you to be able to see this group. Yeah, but what it was like, I, I came down in 84, which was like the uh, Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, Sugar Hill Gang, and Curtis Blow days. Like, those other groups that you just named, um, they blew up after I came down here to Atlanta. You know what I'm saying? Oh, okay, and, okay. They blew up later. Yeah, and I'll be okay. quite honest with you. Like, I wasn't, you know, even though I, I came up in Money Earning Mount Vernon, New York, I wasn't really a hip hop head. Like I enjoyed the the, the hip hop movement, but I wasn't that hip hop head. So I'm mm. recite to you uh, my favorite Big Daddy Kane record. You know, I, I I was I was good with Heavy D and the boys because we had went to high school together. You know what I'm saying? Um, mm. But you know, I wasn't a hip hop head where I could you know Eric B and Rakim, KRS One. You know, even so, well, Salt and Pepper was kind of pop. You know, you know I could I could. I could uh, I mess with that a little bit, you know what I'm saying. Plus, they were two fine sisters. So. <laughs> Don't we know? So where is the, where is the group of rest of the development from? They're from Milwaukee. Well, the lead speech is from Milwaukee. You know what I'm saying? He yeah. hooked up with his partner, headliner, uh, here in Atlanta. But uh, originally, um, the speech was from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Okay. So earlier, trying to take it back a little bit, you mentioned Jack the Rapper. Now, you know the BMF series right now is, is real popping, and they mentioned Jack the Rapper with Big Meech going, trying to, you know, handle his business. But what exactly was Jack the Rapper? Jack the Rapper was a big radio convention where um, all the major artists, uh, all the major labels, rather, would bring their artists down, and um, radio stations would come in. Jack the Rapper was a famous DJ back in the day. And he would hold this convention here in Atlanta and, um, you know, where all the new artists would display themselves, you know what I'm saying, and, uh, and, and end up getting broke. As a matter of fact, that was one of the reasons why L.A. and Babyface ended up coming here to Atlanta because um, uh, they were doing a release party for Karen White, the Karen White album, which they had produced. The album was Superwoman on it. I'm not okay. Sure Superwoman. You know. You, they fell in love with the city and they ended up moving their operation here to create the face records. Man, that's a whole nother movement in itself, man. I mean, yeah. shit. To really, to really get these people, man, like your experiences and really what it was like 
And that was, well, I don't even think we got enough time for that. We had to do a part four, five, and six, you know what right. I'm saying? Well, that type of career, yeah. he had to yeah. take that in stages, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. But what was Jermaine Dupri at when you met him? Like, what, what, where was he at in, within his career? He, he had just finished producing Silk Town Leather on Geffen Records. Like, he was one of the youngest producers ever to do a whole project by himself on a major label. And, um, yeah, he was still living with, with Mom Duke, so, you know, on Judy Lane. So I would go and, um, you know, go hang out with him. My, my, my boy, David Kidd, rest in peace, uh, introduced us. Um, and we, we, uh, we, we just yeah. gravitated towards each other. You know what I'm saying? Like he was really yeah. cool, super talented guy, like worked his butt off from, from sun, sunrise to sunset. He stayed in the, in the, in the lab, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, I, I just uh, 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 enjoyed watching him work and watching him do his thing. Okay. Okay. So after you uh, after you delivered the rest of development to Itchy Barn, what did that do for you? Well, no. Um, a rest of development that got delivered to to Michael Malden, not to Itchy Barn. Okay. Michael okay. Malden, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, it's cool. Michael Malden got me a job at Itchy Barn Records. You know what I'm saying? So what that did to me was it, you know, it, it gave me a little bit of influence, even though the records that we were marketing back then were, weren't all that. I finally got a, a big record, the summer of 90, uh, 1991, I finally got a, a big record with uh, MC Breeds, Ain't No Future In Your Front. Yeah. So I was one of the ones all responsible for I'm plastic. Yeah. Plastic. Breaking that record. You know what I'm saying? So Yeah. yeah. That, yeah, that, that was uh, that was the thing. So, what you think the? Uh, I mean, then we we gonna go into the free Nick experience. And so, so at that time <clears throat> during that era, and you breaking these records, the year was was it still around eighty five, or was that a little bit later? Or oh, much later, I didn't, I didn't, I think my first real freak Nick was when I was managing Outkast in nineteen ninety four. Because you know we were, you know, and the, and they tell that story in the um, in the in the documentary. Mm -hmm. actually, one of the ways we actually broke Outkast was putting together a sampler record and passing it out, and Outkast actually performing during Freaknik. You know what I'm saying? And yeah. And members of the Goody Mob, you know, uh, because they they were featured on some of the records on that album. So, you know, that's what that's when I really got into Freaknik and being in, in all that traffic and seeing all the the craziness that came along with it was 1994. That was my era. See, a lot of people see the finished product, man, from what you deliver to the world. But what was that creative process like watching watching uh, Outkast in the studio, watching them grind, watching them get in ciphers on the block, watching them stop and just, you know, write rhymes or how they was doing it. What was that creative process like? So let me tell you, that, that was some of the best, those were some of the best times because um, some, some crazy going on here on the freeway. That was some of the best times for us, man, because we didn't have that. We were all broke, you know. So yeah. we were, we were uh, at the studio. The studio that, that now Big Boy owns, Stankonia, it used to be called Boss Down, and Bobby Brown owned the studio. That's where we recorded. Yeah, um, I heard about that. The Cadillac music. So we'd be sleeping on couches and stuff like that, and, you know. Uh, eating rally burgers and stuff, you know. Yeah. And, um, you know, just trying to trying to get in where we fit. Yeah. And um, yeah. You know, it was it, dude. It was an exciting time, man. For real, for real. You know. So and then watching them work. So in between the dungeon, which was um, Rico Wade's mama's house, um, recording in that basement, and then going over to Boston, you know, it, it was it was it was a labor of love, but it, it came out very well it came out real well for us yeah, yeah. so um so when outcast performed at the free nick in 94 you talking about a free nick being damn near at his peak you know what yeah. i'm saying yeah. this has been years and years a whole lot of notoriety people been talking about it you know what i'm saying every year they just like oh yeah we're gonna do a big and better but when outcast came out with that smash hit and, and especially like before the free Nick, you know, like when they came out with it and then performed it, 
what how did the crowd receive it being that it's Atlanta's own at that moment I mean, moment in that time? Yeah, let me tell you something. Like Shanti Das, who was running promo and marketing over at um at the face, she did an amazing job, you know, marketing to the whole freaknik crowd. You know, Shanti's also in the um she's in the documentary. Uh the freaknik documentary as well. Yeah, but, I actually so, follow her on Instagram too. I didn't know that she was plugged in that deep back though. Oh yeah, yeah. Shanti, Shanti I didn't know her roots was that far back. To be honest. Yeah, yeah, she was she was she was she came out aces, man. She came up with she's the one who came up with the um the gold picnic that we did. We did the Southern playlist and Cadillac music picnic, you know, where we yeah. had Biggie performing and stuff like that. Yeah. It was crazy. She had a lot of really good ideas. And she had people bumping you know, Southern player listening from all around the country, bumping the music because she was passing them out to people in the cars, you know, so that. So she's had a, did she have a street team? Were you talking about her doing it herself? She had a street team. She had a street team. Okay. So, but she was getting the music out. That was the important part. She was getting the music out to everybody. You know what I'm saying? And, and, you know, when they left Freaknik, they left with these cassettes. And let me tell you, that was masterful within itself because people had the music yeah you know, they could uh, take it with they them. were taking it back to yeah taking it back yeah take it back to their towns and that was spread they would dub the tapes and that right. was spread a, a lot of people don't know about the cassette tapes and dubbing the tapes and stuff yeah yeah man i i had my own share i remember uh, i remember when i used to sit in my room man back in the 90s man my my first my first infatuation with music didn't really come from the South, even though I'm from the South, mm-hmm. it came from the West. I mean, Snoop Dogg was just like something that's out of this world. You know what I'm saying? When I was a, you know, little kid, it was like, Mama, I don't care what you give me for my birthday. Just give me that Snoop Dogg tape. And I would sit right there and I would play, you know, buy these little mixtapes or whatever and just record something every time it came on the radio. I hate catching it late because you couldn't even catch the whole song. Right. So, yeah, man, that era was just different, man. Yeah, and I'm And I know the ground was different. Man, the '90s was was a uh, 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 era to remember. I promise you that. Like, I'm so glad that I came up within that era of of you know, music, not just hip hop, R and B, and and you know everything that we were doing here in Atlanta. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So you know, I'm very proud of the movement. I'm, I'm proud of my accomplishments within that movement. Yeah. You know. It, it, it was just a. It was a good time. It was a great. It was a great decade. Man, you know, um, you. I know you used to. Did you? Did you manage Mister the Bobby Valentino and um? Yeah. yeah my man, I didn't Harry. know. I didn't know Akon went back that far with uh Bobby V and you. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, after I signed um Mister with Eric Johnston, um, uh, Eric Johnston gave me a dat, and it of of Akon. And Akon was the second person that I signed. I signed him to Electra Records, and we released a single called Operations of Nature. So, yeah, you know, yeah, I, we go, so I go way back with Akon. So, look, a lot of people hear about the loop music. A lot of people know about this, but there was a real R&B time at the same time, too, right. with the escapes, you know, with, with, with the whole movement. Yeah. So what was the effect of that R&B music at the same time, too? Because we only hear the A side of the hip-hop and the loops and stuff, but let the people know how they was killing it on the R&B side of that time, too. Man, we had Jagged Edge, we had 112, we had Monica, we had Sierra, we had Kerry Hilson, we had Usher, we had Tony Braxton. Like, we were killing it in R&B. And you know what I'm saying? We're, we're known for the hip-hop. But people have to understand, they have to realize that, yo, we were killing it on the charts with with with, a, with R&B records that were going pop. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Understand. Yeah, but I mean, pink. you know, even... You had what? We had Pink. The artist Pink. Pink? pink. Oh, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, white girl singer? Yeah, yeah. She came she oh. from here, but she came from here. Her career was birthed here at the Face Records, yeah. Okay. So so let the people know exactly what your position was at LaFace Records. I didn't have a position at, at LaFace. LaFace knew me because, you know, they knew 
the 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 powers that be knew that I put together the group TLC. You know, okay. Pebbles got them the deal at the face, but I put the group together. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So they knew me from that, and then they knew me from managing organized noise and, and subsequently outcast, and then working alongside the members of the Goody Mob to help put that unit together. That's yeah. how they know it. Yeah. You know, so Rest I in peace, left out, man. man. What's that? I say R.I.P. Left Eye, man. You know that was that's like a that's a true true legend. I love an independent spirit. I love somebody that you know is herself at all times, and that's that's who she always appeared to be. Yeah, no, she was unapologetically her. You know what I'm saying? You know she wouldn't change for nobody. <laughs> you know she did her thing. Yeah. You know, and that's what it was. So look, so. From your perspective, when when you were on, like everybody is seeing the parties of the of the out of towners and they coming and going on the freak nick thing, you know, people coming from all over. We already know that. But what was those celebrity? You know, of course, the celebrities kind of mingled. That's what Atlanta was known for when I started coming to Atlanta. Was that everybody was talking about? Man, you can go to Atlanta. You go in the club and see a celebrity just right here. You know what right. I'm saying? It ain't, right. You know, back then there weren't no sections. People didn't have sections. You know, they might have had a VIP, but it wasn't right. like every individual boost and stuff like that. So what was it like being on the celebrity side affiliated? You know what I'm saying? Version of the free net. And you know what? It was cool, man, because, you know, although they were becoming celebrities, when I was associated with, with like, Outkast and Organized Noise and Goody Mob, they weren't superstars, you know what I'm saying? So everybody were, were had that 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 mindset where we we just level headed, you know what I'm saying? We hadn't reached, you know. Andre always talked about that in in, in its music, you know what I'm saying? It's like, yo, y'all looking at me as this, but you know, I, I'm breaking my neck working check to check, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, you know, so it was cool. That whole situation was cool, but it was um we all just stayed level-headed man you know we we weren't the bottle popping type people <laughs> you know we weren't in the club play. and then back then you know people didn't come to parties like you said and sit in sections just to watch people we came to clubs to party to dance you know what i'm saying meet females or whatever you know what I'm oh saying? yeah it was really a party vibe nowadays man these people you know they too cool for school man they smoking their hookahs they got their drinks in their sections and they they just people watching you know what I'm saying? Nobody wants yeah. to dance anymore. Nobody wants to like socialize. That. It's no. anti-social. It's almost like you're losing the fun, man. Exactly. They 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 socialize more on social media than they do face to face. Times have changed, man. Yes, sir. You know. Yeah. Yes, sir. I I'm a, I'm not even really a club of myself no more, man. It's like if I don't go to Vegas or if I don't go to Houston or something like that. You know, when I'm in Atlanta, I just go to the studio, man. I just record. I, I do what I got to do when I'm out. I don't even go to the club unless I'm trying to get a song played. Yeah. You know, it's just the, the atmosphere has changed. But I know what it's like. Like, when you coming up in your town and you popular and you blowing, the people that know you, like, oh, that's just Andre. He ain't, you know what I'm saying? Said it, said it, said You know what I'm saying? He just go, you know, he go to Tri City, said it, said it. You know what I'm saying? Like, right. you a star, but they ain't looking at you like you this mega thing like the world gonna see you right. until you out of there and when you out of there then it's like oh man andre really really blew up or you know well, I mean, you t-boz know, really blew up or, that was the mentality here in atlanta like because these people because we were such a small circle here in atlanta you know what i'm saying you had to be out of town to really get psyched up about when you saw these people out you know what I'm saying? So, oh, that's Andre 3000, that's Three Stacks, that's Big Boy, that's, that's, those are the girls from TLC. You know, yeah. but if, if you live here, you know, you you know, you can walk in Lenox Mall and see them walking, shopping and stuff like that. You know, they didn't need a lot of people around them and they didn't, you know, they didn't cause all that fanfare. You know, most of the time they didn't need any security, you know, because it's like, oh, that's just, that's just left eye. You know, I saw left eye in the mall. And then, you know, we didn't have any social media and stuff like that then. So nobody was taking pictures and stuff like that. So people were free to, to be who they were at that particular moment. You know what, what I'm saying? So what was your relationship that, that, like? So one of the biggest one of the biggest acts of that era, you know, aside the outcast, man, 
little bit before Outcast was Chris Cross. Okay. And I mean, Chris Cross just took the world by storm, man. I mean, I couldn't believe Jermaine wrote and produced so much on that album. And he was still young. He's still a teenager. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But to find these two guys and have the mind to say, man, you know what? I want to do this. Like, what was it like for you to see him take that take that group to that level? I mean, yeah, he yeah. made good good music and he did his thing, but that group, some kids to a whole nother level worldwide. I don't remember kids being I, were they the first? Um, no, you know, um, were they the first? Yeah, they could have been the first. As a matter of fact, I don't remember any before them. No, uh -uh. They, uh, most of them came like Bob Deep. Bob Deep was teenagers. Illegal came after them. You know, Young Shaheen came after them. So no, they were they were definitely they set the the model for the young teenage rappers. You know, preteen rappers. If they yeah. weren't the first, they were the first to do it to that level that yeah, I can remember. Yeah, no, no young rapper has has achieved what they not even Bow Wow has achieved the the level. Oh like, yeah, Bow Wow had a little bit. He had a little bit more longevity, but that first album that uh, Chris Cross did totally like, crossed that, out. Yeah, totally crossed out. That single went mm -hmm. double platinum. If I'm not mistaken, the album went four or five times platinum. That was a big album. And we talking about we ain't talking about you hearing it on the radio a few times and you getting a plaque. We talking about four or five million people getting right. out their bed, standing in line, going They're to the store, the paying ten ninety nine with right. tax, opening a for wrap off a case. You see what I'm saying? And That's plucking right. that motherfucker in the deck. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, yeah, no that's a different thing. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, you can't well, fake you know, that. Radio. What's that? Yes, yeah, so if you can't fake that now, them sales, them, them actual sales. Right. I was right. I was a little disappointed when they transitioned over into the streaming and how they how they count streams and stuff like that. Now. Hey man, everything is 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 changed. There's a pop, uh, pros and cons to it. You know what I'm saying? Now you know you can let, you can take advantage. You have, you're in control of your own destiny. The only problem with that is there's a lot more bullshit out there. That you got to wade through to get to the real music, you feel me? You know, yeah. but, but you know, it's it's a it's a blessing and a curse at the same time. You know what I'm saying? You have to really stick with it. You have to be tenacious. You have to be consistent, and you know, to to really make it really work, that's what you have to do. So, what was the uh, you know, the people want to know what the what was the crowd like out there, like? People hear about the people on the street, the people in the parks and stuff like that. But what was it like driving out there, seeing people on the cars all over the city? It won't just contain the one area. It was crazy. It was not contained in one area. It was all over the city. You couldn't drive anywhere. You'd be sitting in traffic for hours. For you hours. might as well pull over, right? <laughs> you pull over because, and you know, people were partying on the freeway. On, That's on the freeway. Oh, that's how crazy it was, man. <laughs> that's how crazy it was because you, you couldn't go around, you couldn't do nothing. You know what I'm saying? You, or you, it was best for you to, to take whatever public transportation you could take and then get out there and, and work the best way you could. I, See, me being from Raleigh, North Carolina, man, I remember uh, what we had as our version of the free Nick down in Myrtle Beach called Bite Week. Right, right. Now, yeah. early 2000s, man, 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 I remember everybody ain't had no cell phone. You know what I'm saying? I remember going to the to the Walgreens, getting loaded up with Polaroid cameras. You know what I'm saying? Loading up with disposable cameras. Like, damn, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I got to Yo, we're going to be late yeah. this year. You know, and if you and if you really had a little change, you might have had a little camcorder. You know what I'm saying? Right. Right. You know, you might have had a little camcorder. Damn quarter, but I remember going to, to going out there, man, and the streets is packed. The the hotels was packed. I'm talking about you you meeting girls, man. They 
on the side of the buildings, in the cars. You mean you might go to a hotel room or you know, to your hotel room and walk past a door that's open and it's seven, eight girls in the room getting dressed like, hey, oh he cute. Say the set of come on in here, you know what I'm saying? And it was just different. What was it like down at Freak Me? It's the same. Same, same thing. Only more people. Yeah, oh. yeah. Same. <laughs> only more people. Same as you know, some people didn't have they were sleeping in their cars. You know what I'm saying? Some people didn't even have hotel rooms, man. They were just here. You know? Yeah. So um you could you you know, you didn't have to worry about going in a hotel because they were on the women were on the streets. You what time of the year was this? What's that? What time break. of the year spring was break. it here? Spring, spring break. break. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, uh, yo, you know, nowadays everybody driving, everybody want to pull up in the Ferraris. Everybody want to have a lamb. Everybody want to have a color in there. But back then, that wasn't the era. You know, tell them about the, you know, what, what were they driving? I remember the Jeeps. I remember yeah, the T-Tops. You know, they talked about this in the in the documentary too, man. You know, they were driving the it cars, but they weren't the celebrity cars. They weren't the luxury cars. You know, you know those little what what do you say the uh, the the small rag top jeeps. You know what I'm saying? Those those little those they were expensive at the time, but you know yeah, the Suzuki jeeps. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm the, Rodeo, the Pontiacs, like the Thunderbirds. That. You know, so, you know, and, and, you know, people had souped up cars too now. You know what I'm saying? You had the flatbed trucks. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. You know, so it was all, man, you saw a little bit of everything out here, freak me. People, people driving a little bit of everything from the busted up vehicles to the little cute girly vehicles. They, they were all types of rides were out here. The bikes, they were doing bikes here too, but it was mainly cars. Bikes were the best because you could weave in and out of traffic. You could move if you had a bike. So you know it's 2024, so we talking about 30 plus years ago. You know, what were the prices like then? You know, when you bought a drink, when you bought a plate of food, when you went and got some ice cream, when your girl got her hair done, when your girl, when you got a pair, you know what I'm saying? What was that like? Man, you know, it's funny because like you're used to inflation now, right? But yeah. But, you know, and it probably, you probably would have thought, well, yeah, that's expensive back then. But, you know, compared to now, but it really wasn't. It wasn't. You yeah. Know, you know, so it well, you could probably get a drink for $5 or whatever. You know what I'm saying? You know, you get your nails done. I wasn't really into getting my nails done or getting anybody, any females nails done either. You know, so I, I couldn't even tell you what that was all about. <laughs> I, I, when I was out there, when you know the the few times I was out there, I was it was all about self and my boys. Like, yo, okay, what we gonna yeah. do? Where, where we performing? What club we going to? You know, you like, getting that money? You focus on that money, right? <laughs> all right. So we're gonna fast forward it a little bit, man, and uh, we're gonna talk about we're gonna talk about what it is that you that you that you know how did you i know that you got out of the music well, not necessarily got out of the music but you saw other areas of entertainment that you want to get into like film you know what made you transition into film and also well I, I'm, I'm gonna let you answer that before i go into the next one well you know i had done a lot in music you know what i'm saying i had i had reached a point in my life where you know when COVID came that i wanted to switch you know, when, when COVID was here, I had a lot of downtime and I wanted to do something different. And um, I always wanted to get into film and TV and that was the time for me to get into film and TV. You know, so I had a couple of projects and I had a couple of people, you know, interested in, in doing some things. You know what I'm saying? Um, so, yeah, you know, I, I, I took advantage of that situation, you know, so. So are you still managing artists? I, you know what? Yeah, I'm. I'm I went back and and got back into music. You know what I'm saying? Um, can I give you this? Right, hold on one second. All right. Thank you. 
Um, I'm back into music now. Matter of fact, you know, uh, I partnered up with, with a partner of mine. Now I'm about to get into the whole label game, you know, which I really wasn't interested in getting into anymore. But, you know, it, when I, I got myself a, a group of Peach Three. That's my new group. Y'all go check them out at Peach Three Music. On Instagram, all their social media is at Peace Street Music. My new female group that I put together with my with my partner, uh, Dion Kubis. And, um, you know, I partnered up with, with a guy, and we're going to start this label, my boy Mike Finney. And we're going to start this label. You know what I'm saying? We just we just signed our distribution deal today. You know today? Yeah, we <laughs> just signed our distribution deal. And, you know, we, we're going we're gonna to roll with this thing. I think that. You know, I, I got, I, 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 you know, I went back to my, my root roots. You know, I did well with, with TLC and Escape. You know what I'm saying? Those are two groups that I helped get started back in the 90s. And I was like, okay, you know, we're, we're missing the whole female group element from American music now. So let me see if I can go ahead. And uh, I was good at in the 90s. Let me see if, if it's like riding a bike. You know what I'm saying? How about lost? Yeah, myself, you know I noticed saying? that, man. You don't really see a lot of groups no more. Male or nah, female, man. man. Uh uh-uh. uh, no, they they all you got is a bunch of solo acts, you know. A lot of lone wolves, man. Yeah, you know. So I wasn't really interested in putting out another f- uh, solo male or solo female, because you know you have to dig through a whole lot of people. You know, you 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 competing with them, but when when you see a lane where there's nobody in that lane or very few people in that lane, it's like okay, I, this is where I need to tackle, you know, and this is what I'm good at. You know what I'm saying? So I decided to, to take that road. And you guys who who's on here now, um, y'all go check out Peach Street Music, you know, on Instagram. Follow them, follow their journey. Watch, I'm telling y'all now, y'all, y'all, y'all are not gonna be disappointed. And you know, in, in six months you're gonna be like, damn. Ian was on smooth, was it smooth talking? Smooth Rally, conversation. Riley smooth. Riley smooth show. <laughs> yeah, smooth talking conversation. About these girls, you know what I'm saying? Now they all yeah. winning awards and stuff like that. Like these girls are bad. <laughs> they're 18 years old. They're incredible dancers. You know. Where they from? They're they from here. That's why they're from Atlanta. Peach three. Okay. okay. Peach three. Yeah. Okay. I thought you said Peach tree. No, I'm sorry. Peach three. Okay. But that's All right. thing, like it's a play on peach tree. Okay. You know. So I'm look, the, when it comes to the artist development then versus now, what you know the attention span of most listeners ain't really as long as they used to be. So people are really just kind of like shoving out songs, shoving out songs, and hoping some a stick to the wall. Right. For somebody that's coming. Coming in the game that, that wants to be an artist, that wants to be a songwriter, that wants to be a producer, what's what's the best piece of advice you can give them on that journey as far as, you know, when it comes to cultivating in their craft? I mean, you can't negate or, or, or forget about artist development. I'm always going to be a component of artist development, man. Always. That, that'll never change. You know, I'll, I'll, uh, even Peach 3, I have them in vocal classes. I have them in, in creative uh, direction and, and choreography classes with, with Dinesha, my girl Dinesha, who's their creative director. You know, I'm putting them in media classes all to make them, you can't forget that aspect uh, of star building, you know, and you can't, you know, sit there and just throw out music. You know, if something does catch you, you're going to be prepared to go out on the road to tour to do shows and stuff like that. You know, yeah. I want when when my girls hit, you know, I want them ready. It's like, okay, we got this. We're gonna do this show. We're gonna open up here. We're gonna go to this presentation. You know, uh, and that's the way it's gonna be. Social media is key. It's definitely key. You know what I'm saying? But you can't let that be the only vehicle that you use to to blow yourself up as an artist. You know what I'm saying? You have to get out there. You have to shake hands people have to see who you are and you have to develop that word of mouth as well. You know, people saying, yeah, I went and saw them live. They dope. You know what I'm saying? And start building that core fan base so that they can go to social media and start talking about you. And that's how, you know, you start to go virally, you know, 
Now you can go yeah. viral on your own on just on social media, but you you've seen people crash and burn when it comes time to deliver the the goods in real life. You know what I'm saying? When they have to go on stage and perform and they're not prepared to do that. You know? So no, I, I started I yeah. started that early on in the game, man. That's the first thing. Before we even started recording music, I had to in development. Okay. So I'm gonna ask you for the for you know the same question when it comes to the film world. You know, nowadays everything is about content. Freak Nick was a, you know, we wouldn't even know about it if people didn't get the content to create those memories, to to have the experiences to be able to share and tell people what it was like. You know, what what are those challenges and what is their development like going through it on a film, uh, from a film perspective? I mean, you know, film is, is a lot of fun. You you know, you get out there, you 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 record these films. The only thing with film, like you have to be connected, you know what I'm saying, when you're doing these projects. It's not enough just to be funded. You have to be connected. Mm. You know what I'm saying? The people know me from doing music, so I can go out and reach out. To certain people and and nowadays you know like we're getting ready to do right now i could go ahead and release something and throw it out there to the world you know what i'm saying and let them decide whether or not they want to jump on it it's not that cost effective to do that with film and stuff that you're filming and things of that nature so mm. you know um but you know you 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 use what you're good at to help you get in to the doors and you may not be able to get in through the front door but you can sneak into a window you know what i'm saying you know, a back window mm -hmm. or something like that and and that's you know that's what i intend on doing you know you know man, man you know you really gonna have to tell your story man because even right now while you telling it they they still don't know you still ain't you still ain't really giving them who you are you know what I'm saying? I know you from being just a down to earth guy, easy to talk to, don't dress celebrity, don't act celebrity. But I remember when I came out the studio that session, I walked out. I said, "God damn, the drummer boy, you over here talking to the drummer boy." I'm like, "God damn, nigga, I listen to all your music." <laughs> you right. know what I'm saying? I'm like, "God, damn, he ain't know everybody." You know what I'm saying? So you really, you you have to tell your story, man, and really break it down sometime and jot your notes down, man, and I'm, really I'm give yourself that the, biopic. Yeah, I'm working on I'm working on a biopic, you know, about the music scene here in Atlanta. Um, I'm working on it. I'm, I want to get it done. You know what I'm saying? And I want to be able to get it out there to people. So hopefully, you know, the the whole freak Nick thing will garner enough interest. Be like, yo, there's, there's a whole nother angle that we can approach here, you know, as it relates, because there's, there's been a lot of uh, documentaries about the hip hop scene in Atlanta, but no real music documentary about the actual music scene, because we were more than just hip hop here. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Like, yeah. I, like you said earlier, yeah. man, we had a lot of R&B stars, stars. stars that came out of Atlanta as well, you know, so. Neo Soul. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah. and you know, I, I was part of a lot yes. of that stuff in, yeah. in one shape, form, or another. So, you know, I'm I'm working on telling that story. Yeah, man. And and, and what aspect of that scene that gets overlooked, man, is spoken word. You know, Atlanta had a big spoken word scene at one time, man. We we a did, big spoken I, I, word scene. I was looking to sign a, a spoken word artist. You know, when I was at Electra. I, I had a, a spoken word artist that was uh, that I was looking to sign, uh, but LaFace beat me to the punch. LaFace ended up signing her. You know what I'm saying? But Sonia Marie was my, my spoken word artist that I, I, I adored. I thought she was really dope. You know, and that was my experiment, my experimenting in the whole social media, uh, the uh, the poet thing or the spoken word thing. Um, there was also a very aggressive alternative uh, rock a black rock scene here too you know what i'm saying that that a lot of people don't know about i want to tell that story too uh with with joy mobius treat three five human uh a lot of uh, edith wish there was a lot of uh urban rock situations going on here mm -hmm. uh that a lot of people didn't know about it was a scene that a lot of people didn't know about you know and i want to you know uh, it's a story that i want to tell as well so look, when you were at Electra, was Sylvia Rome running the show yes. at that time? Yes, she's the one who 
How did how did you meet her? I didn't. She heard about what I was. She doing found you. Atlanta. She found me. Wow. She found me. You know, Outcast was was blowing up. Uh, I was managing Goody Mob. You know what I'm saying. I was also representing Escape. I had, you know, representing Escape. So she knew about my background and, and sought me out. Hey man, you know they say the same thing about the NBA man or the NFL. They say, look, if you good enough, trust me. The NBA gonna find mm -hmm. you. The NFL gonna find mm -hmm. you. And it's the same mm -hmm. way with music. A lot of times, a lot of up and coming artists start to feel like, oh, I gotta do this record with this big such and such and such. Or oh, I gotta, you know, if I can get me a drummer boy track, or if I can get me a, uh, you know, if I can get me a Dr. Dre track, or if I can get me a, uh, you know, a Jermaine Dupree track, I can blow. If I can get a feature with Usher, oh, it's out of here. But just let them know if you are the sh ish in your town, in your spirit, with your fans, the label's going to come find you. Uh, they yeah, want to know yeah. who's selling their stuff on their own. They, if you can move, if you, you know, my, my thing is, hey, find you 5,000 fans in 10 states. If you can find 5,000 fans in a whole state and get 10 states, well, you got 50,000 people. Mm -hmm. And if them 50,000 people are willing to spend $10 or $20 with you, you're talking about a bag. Mm -hmm. And if you're able to get $10 out of, out of 50,000 people and you can make a half a million on your own, a label's going to say, man, if they can sell 50,000, maybe we can take them to 500,000. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can take them to six hundred thousand. We could easily take them to two hundred thousand and make two to four million. Mm -hmm. And that's how you create that value. Yep. Well, I mean, you know, but you gotta be willing to step out of there. A lot of people saying, Yeah, I need a drama boy track or I need a Jermaine Dupri track. You know what I'm saying? Those are nice to have, but if you're if you're a great artist, your music's gonna get out there either way. Yeah. Either way, if you're a great artist, you don't you don't need the name value. You don't necessarily need that feature, you know, to get yourself out there. It helps. I'm not going to lie. It definitely helps if you have a, a banger by a drama boy or Jermaine Dupri. It helps. But if you're a good artist, like at the end of the day, you're going to rise to the top anyway. Now, I don't have, I so, don't have those relationships with the drama boys and the Jermaine Dupri's, but I don't have them. They're not producing Peach 3 at this point. So I got a whole new set of people working on Peace Street. I got my boy Libby, and I got Sir and Scion of Mind Trip producing them at this point. You know what I'm saying? And I'm, I'm not afraid to to look at up-and-coming producers and, um, you know, giving them their shot. You know what I'm saying? Because I know that my group can carry their own weight. I don't have to depend on somebody, yeah. you know, a superstar producer or a superstar um, uh, feature to take this group to the next level. They're going to do it all on their own. So in your opinion, man, from the experiences that you've had in the film and the, and the uh, music industries, how do you know the difference between someone that's talented and a bona fide star? What's oh, the man. impact that, that, that you see that separates the two? I mean, you, you see that every day, man. You see people that can sing their faces off. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, it, it's great, but that don't mean that that's what's going to attract. I mean, you know, you, you think about it like, you know, even even uh, amongst, you know, our people, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, who were the better singers? Escape? Escape could sing their faces off, right? Right? Yeah. Okay. TLC were they weren't put together for a singing. You understand what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah. Who sold more records? Mm. You understand? Yeah. So you easily know, TLC. You know, so you know, you 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 know, like when people put for, and I'm not saying that that Escape wasn't stars. That's not what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. I'm saying what people know. generally gravitate towards is a certain swag and a certain situation that goes along with with being an artist you know what i'm saying so uh, it was like when when i was putting tlc together and and i i got to tion tion was the last member that i put in the group they weren't called tlc then they were called i thought left eye was, was the last no, member uh, uh, left eye was in the group before tion tion was the last person i put in the group 
Was it was it somebody in there before Tian? Yeah, it was a girl named Crystal. She was she I was putting the group together for Crystal. Don't go by what you see on TV. Mm -hmm. Don't go by you don't go so by tell us about that. TV. Tell us about that. How tell us about how that process came together. Well, I was just looking for a female version of Belle Biv DeVoe. You know what I'm saying? Okay. I, I was like, What year was two. this? This was in 90. Okay. Uh, late, uh, 89, 90. All right. And, um, so I was going through a bunch of girls. I had this one girl, like I said, Crystal. I was matching her up with a bunch of different girls. And um, Rico Wade finally came to me and said, yo, um, I got this, this girl that I want you to meet. And I was like, all right, cool. You know, let, let me let me see what's up. And the, the girl couldn't make the meeting, so he brought another girl, uh, which was uh left eye, mm -hmm. and she auditioned for me. She almost didn't make the group because she wasn't dressed the way I wanted her to be dressed, but you know, you know, she had she thought that I was looking for a different thing. So ultimately, uh uh left eye became part of the group. And then that night I was like, Yo, Rico, I wanna see this girl that you talking about that was supposed to come so two o'clock in the morning we went and checked out this uh this girl <laughs> which, which turned out to be t-boss and uh -huh. I, my phone about to die too man. <laughs> okay okay thank you um but yeah you know she turned out to be that 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 one you know what i'm saying and um that's how that's how the, the group was born. Did she have that signature haircut back then? No, she had a different hairstyle back then. It wasn't <laughs> the signature joint. It wasn't the signature joint. Bill, but she was like a hairstylist anyway, man. You know what yeah. I'm saying? But she was just a beautiful sister, man. Ti was just just a beautiful sister. And um she went and she had that what I call that it jacket. So she didn't even have to sing for me. She did. She ended up singing for me, but um, she didn't have to sing for me, man. I was just like, yo, you in the group, man. You knew she just had that appeal, that 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 allure, yeah. you know, I can, it, it just, you know, I, Beyonce is very talented. I'm not taking that away from her, but it's kind of like when you saw Destiny's Child, but you saw Beyonce, it was just like, she's got that allure to her, right. you know? Going back to what you were saying about uh, putting together these groups, I remember I used to play sports in school, and, and the coach said, "Listen, he said, listen, I'm not looking for the, you know, this is a basketball team. He said, I'm not looking for the 15 best players. I got to put together the best team. Right, right. You know, exactly. You no, know, everybody, you know, this guy might block better. This guy might steal. You know, he might run faster. This guy might be a better dribbler, passer." You know, but everybody can't be the best player. Just because you can score more than this person or such and such, that's not what's going to make us win the championship. What's we got to come together and have the best team. So how important is that team as – go ahead. Say, that's why the 90s Bulls were so successful. You know what I'm saying? They, they knew who the star on their team was. You know what I'm saying? And everybody else played their position. Scottie Pippen played his position. You know, Dennis Rodman played his position. You know, and the rest of the, the players, Steve Kerr played his position. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, everybody needs, if, if you go into it with that type of mentality, then you're going to win every single time. Just play your position, you know? So we're going to translate that to the day. So going into it, you see a lot of artists doing their own thing. Yeah, you might have this producer, you might have this manager, you might have this engineer, but let them know how powerful it is to put together a team of people that's your go-to people, that's your core, that you can say, okay, this is the, these are the people that understand me, that know my sound, I know what they're good of. You know, how important is putting together that, that collaboration? Superstar thing, it's, it's definitely important. You know what I'm saying? You gotta have good people. Like you, you've been hearing these, um, these actors, you know, especially the female, black female actors complain, and you know, and I'm sitting up there thinking like, yo, who did you have on your team? Yeah. To, to help, to, to guide you through this thing. Who's, who's yeah. not, you know, doing what they supposed to do? You know what I'm saying? Like, I can always see when you just starting out, you know, handling some things, but once you get to a, a point where it's like, yo, 
nah, that's not going to fly. Just like Beyonce, you know what I'm saying? When Beyonce became Beyonce, that's when she was like, okay, yeah, well, you, you know, if you're going to write for my, um, for my projects, you know, you're going to have to give up some of that pub. You know what I'm saying? That was the people around her saying, yo, this, that, and the third, you know, and making sure that she's always looked out for. But at the same time, people who, who wrote for her knew, hey, if I have a single on Beyonce, this is going to change my life. It's going to do this. It's going to go, you, yo, you can have 100% of something like this. Right. It could be 100%, but it might be like this. Or you can have 25% of something like this. Exactly. You know. Exactly. Give me the twenty five percent of something that you know is going to explode because everything that Beyonce touches just just it's out of here, man. It's out of here. You know what I'm saying? All right. So you know that, and that's that's how I look at it. But you gotta have that right team. You gotta have that group of people around you that 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 you know know the game. And you know, know how to pace themselves as 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 you grow as an artist. Okay. You know. So 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 I know your phone about to die, man, and I ain't gonna keep you too long. But before we go, since we're talking about the business, man, I want you to drop some jewels on 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 some of these uh, people out here, whether they are artists, whether they filmmakers, whether they're just fans and just love information. Being that you was at ASCAP. You know, and you held the position that you held, you know, the relationship, you know, the industry, you know, the game, you know how the money flows. Let them know how important publishing is. Let them know how important contracts are. Let them know how important having your business is over how talented or how big your single is going to be. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, like like it's, it starts with, with, with the contracts. And making sure your business is in order, having the proper people look over your contracts, or a real entertainment attorney, you know, not your your cousin's real estate attorney. You know what I'm saying? You you have to have the proper people doing that. And then people have to also realize, man, like your publishing, man, that's your retirement fund in this business. You know what I'm saying? Your retirement. The money, yeah, the money that you make through your publishing, man, that's that's the gift that keeps giving. So, if you you know, you've done a song and then next thing you know, it, it's synced in a movie, you know, a commercial picks it up. You know what I'm saying? You know, you've heard you've heard these these songs, these popular songs getting picked up in commercials or you see them in movies and mm -hmm. stuff like that. You know, that's the that's the gift that just keeps giving. You know, you, you turn around and you're receiving a check for your royalties. You know, you, you, you're receiving a, a check from ASCAP, BMI or CSAC. Uh, as it relates to to your publishing, you know, you see in digital royalties from that from the from, you know, the streams, you know what I'm saying? And then you're seeing sync royalties from the, the people who are, are putting your games, uh, video games, putting your music and video games or putting it on commercials, TV shows and films. You know what I'm saying? So that's why it's important. Publishing is important to people, you know, make sure that you're in a position to, to write your own stuff. Because when you get when, when you, we don't yep. have a retirement thing in this business, yeah, you know what I'm saying. So if you want to retire, ain't no four hundred one k in the music industry or the exactly. film industry. You if you don't want to if you don't want to tour all the way up to your eighty years old, you know some people want to tour, you know because they just enjoy it. But if you just want to enjoy life, you can sit back on the songs that you have written, you know, not just for yourself but for other people, and just collect that royalty, man. Or you can sell your, your publishing and now people getting, you know, eight, nine figures for their publishing. And that's another thing I wanted to get your perspective on, man. So what do you think? I, listen, recently, I mean, listen, I'm not the type of guy to count nobody pockets. So that's not what we're doing. But the concept of, man, I built this catalog and, you know, I'm selling it for 20 million, 50 million, 100 million. What do you think about that instead of like holding on to that? You know, let's just say, you know, a lot of these artists are 45 years old or so. Selling that catalog like a Nelly. Man, I just couldn't believe that that catalog, if he lives in 75 and streaming is going the way that it's going and he sold it for 50 million, I can't imagine it not being worth at least 250. Well, let me tell you something. The people buying it are, are Gary, are, are, banking that is going to be worth 250 
You know what I'm saying? But like you say, you know, if you're 45 years old, how much more time you really got in your life? You know what I'm saying? So you, people are thinking like, yo, let me take this money, put some aside for my generational wealth, and then put some, you know, put some in my pocket, make sure you pay Uncle Sam or whatever, put some in my pocket. But wouldn't that be generational wealth though? You holding on to that publisher well, yeah, and passing it down? But you, you, you just don't know what will happen after you pass. You know what yeah. I mean? who who will take control, who's fighting over it or whatever, versus, okay, I got this lump sum of money right now. And I'm looking at it, I'm devil's advocate right now. Okay. I have I have I have two two sides to that sort of thing. I agree All with right. you. Like I believe that holding on to your catalog and passing it down to your your family, to me that seems like the way to go. But I can't not acknowledge the fact that somebody's gonna give me you say fifty million. I've seen people get two hundred million for their catalog mm -hmm. and they like, all right, well cool. I can still build generational wealth with yeah. two hundred million. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I I could take a hundred for myself and put a hundred up for my for my family down the road. Still take care of my family. You know what I'm saying? And and yeah. not worry about whether or not that music and stuff. Let let them people who are taking it, they have the avenues to to put it out and make sure that it makes money or have people cover those songs or sample those songs to make sure you're not going to want to do that with your catalog. You know what I'm saying? But yeah. If you sell it. Let them make their money, and you you get a good deal off of your catalog. I don't see the problem with just saying, "All right, cool. I'm cool." You know, and I can always write more songs. You know what? And I'm you saying? can always write more exactly. songs. Or and let's translate that to the film side. You know, a lot of people don't think about the residuals. You know, Chris Tucker actors in movies they still getting checks because they negotiated those. But the people that are creators, you know. Let these people know how important it is for these creators to understand the business when they're pitching their shows to these networks, when they're pitching their documentaries, when they're doing things like that to understand, listen, it's not about getting a check right now because Netflix will pay you off, Amazon will pay you off, Hulu will pay you off, but you still got to try to negotiate something for the long haul. Well, I mean, you know, that comes with the education, Riley, for real. That you have to educate yourself about any business that you get yourself into. You know what I'm saying? You have to know when to do what, when, how, and why. You understand? Because I'm still educating myself when it comes to film and television. I'm so much of a neophyte when it comes down to that. You know what I'm saying? So, but, you know, you have to, you know, in music, I can sit here and talk to you about music all day. With film and television, I'm still educating myself. But... Unless you, if you're going to get into any of these field, fields, whether it's film and television or music, educating yourself is the most important thing that you could do. You, there are books out there that you could get to let you know about what you're getting yourself into, man. And okay. you have to be able to, to, to actually educate yourself. So for, so for any artist or producer that wants to work with you, let them know that, you know, what services you provide and what it is that they can expect if they contact you and they reach out to you, what is it that you provide to them? What's, you know, uh, what, Look, what type I'm, of I'm service? A, hmm? I'm a consultant. You know what I'm saying? Um, it just depends on, you know, what their budget looks like. You know what I'm saying? Because a lot of people... Everybody want okay. a record deal, though. Everybody want that check. Without the, without the labor pains, you know what I'm See, saying? See, they watching Glory go to go to go to cmg and get that 750 that 500 you know they watching all these people go there that's what they want they want that big check let me, but let, let me tell you something it, <laughs> it, 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 I, it just it does you have to put in the work man you have to you know we wait we with the jury still out with glorilla she got this hey glow record you know it, it was almost over for her after the uh fuck yeah. boy, you know yeah, so, you know, it was like, okay, well, where is she now? She came out with it. She got a new do. She ain't ghetto no more. She's fabulous. You know, got this Halo record out that's starting to blow up. She may have a second life. Let's see what happens after that. Yeah. A lot. She on tour with Megan too. What's that? And she's on, on tour with Megan. Uh, well, and that's I'm sure that's helping her out a great deal. Yes, the, new yeah, fans and stuff like that. So, you know, I, I I really hope it works out for her. Right? And that what and that's the the person who upgraded her team. You know what I'm saying? Another person who has an immaculate team. You know what I'm saying? 
and to me in my humble opinion is just the the worst rapper ever is ice spice you know what i'm saying he got a great team he has an i don't know much team. about ice spice What's that? I don't know much about her, but I believe it because you start to see her everywhere. You got her, her team, her management got her in like, what, she got like a a, a McDonald's meal? No, she, and yeah, she probably, but I got, she's in a, doing a Dunkin' Donuts commercial Dunkin with Ben Affleck. You okay, know what I'm with Ben Affleck? With Ben Affleck. She's at the Super Bowl with Taylor Swift. You know what I'm saying? Her people are making sure that she is visible wherever she goes. You know what I'm saying? Her team, I got. I give them straight up props, bro. Her team is the shit. She's got a re really good team because you know, I, I there's no way in the world I would sign Ice Spice. No way in the world. Yeah, you they're know, based on the music. Nah, yeah, the the music is corny and crappy to me. Yeah, but they know, just listen, know how to market that. Know, it's the market they for. To, they know how to market and they know how to. Yeah. yeah, they know exactly what her audience is. It's like, all right, baby, just bend over and shake your ass in the camera. That's what you need to do. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? <laughs> they're, yeah. they're like, oh no, you're not going to the BET Hip Hop Awards, but you're going to the American Music Awards. You're going yeah, to the you go. Choice Awards. Yeah, you go. Yeah. Be over there with uh, the folks. We're gonna get you over here with the white folk. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That, yeah. That's the you know I'm, I'm watching it because you know last year when she was nominated and won at the BET Award, she wasn't in the audience, but I damn sure I saw her at the People's Choice Awards, sitting next to folks. You know, you know. Children. Yeah. You know, so yeah, relationships are important. Huh? Relationships are important. Management is important. Absolutely. But you know, uh, you know, when these artists and these producers hit you up, and, and you know, people going to see this live. You know, we, I'm gonna I'm make sure that uh, this is the first kickoff to uh, smooth conversations, man. And over time, people going all oh, this 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 conversation is gonna be here. But let let people know that when they contact you, what can they expect? Well, they they you know. The first thing they can expect is me to ask them what their budget is because this don't come for free. Studio time costs, engineers cost, my time cost. You know what I'm saying? So, but I have no problem sitting down and talking to people like I'm talking to you right now. Like mm -hmm. I, 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 I asked you for I, I asked you for nothing. You asked me, you know, what 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 I said, no, Riley, you know, this is the time for me to give it, you know, this is free game right here. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? This is free game. And I don't mind giving this out to people, especially to, 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 you know, people like yourself. We worked together in the past. You know what I'm saying? So I have no yeah. problems giving, you know, giving up my time to smooth conversations. Um, but, you know, people have to realize that, yo, man, if, you, if you're going to come to me, it's like we, we, I'm not taking you to Jermaine Dupree. I'm not taking you to a drummer boy. You know what I'm saying? We're going to work on getting building you up, you know, getting your shit in order. There you Let go. the drama boy come to you. Let the there you come go. to you. You know what I'm saying? And then we can work the situation out. There you go. All right, man. Well, look, man, this I, I, I have really enjoyed the conversation, man. We honestly went past, you know, what I expected for us yeah, to talk. Yeah, you, see, you know what I'm saying? Minutes, I'm yeah. Like, but yeah, but really you know what, though? Good. Yeah, but you know what? It's just it's a whole nother level because we hadn't spoken in years man you know we text i said you hey man what you think about this song hey man you know where you think i can go with this right here you know we had a little small talk but we had and we still haven't really caught up right. but man it's a new day things are changing every day you never know what's gonna happen you know a year from now six months from now two years from now or where where somebody would be and i appreciate you blessing me with your with your conversation man and uh We'll, hopefully we'll be in touch, man. The comments are probably going, you know, go crazy. People are going to want to reach out. People are going to want to have have questions. Uh, you, you're tagged in the uh, in the live or whatever, so I definitely want to be able to catch up with you, man. Absolutely. Some other some other time, and if we have to do a part two later on down the road, you know, I hope you be open to that. Oh yeah, man. All I'm right, definitely open. Next yeah. time I'm gonna have I'm gonna have my girls with me. I'm gonna have Peach Three with me the next time. Oh. Oh, that'll be what's up, man. Hey, look, I got to catch them before they blow so I can say, yo, I was there. Right, right. I got to catch them before they blow so I can say I was there. Peace 3 Music, baby. Check them out on Instagram, Peace man. And anybody, 3. Anybody want to reach out to me, or hit me on the on the DM, man. I, I check my request, uh, my requested DMs. Um, Ian F. Burke, I-A-N-F-B-U-R-K-E. 
you know, hit me up on uh, if you want to set something up. If you want to, you know, I, I, I'll give you 15 minutes free, a 15 minute free phone call. You know, if you want, you know, and then later, if you decide you want to use my services, we can discuss that. But I'll give you 15 minutes on the phone for free. You know what I'm saying? Okay. So that that's that's what I'm willing to do for folk, you know? All right, man. Well, look, man, thank you for your time. I'm going to go ahead and end this live, man. And uh, it was a pleasure catching up with you again, man. And I'll be in contact. You know, I'll give you a shout. Here and there, see how you doing and stuff, but I know you be busy, man. It's you know, it's hard to even get you on the phone. It's hard to even get you on a conversation. Yeah, I got to text you. You, know, you. you got me, though, man. You know, you know like, right, yo, Nah, go. but you my man, though, man. You know, it's all love, bro. You know, I got real, I know you a real genuine guy, man. You know what I'm saying? And I appreciate you, man. You know, I learned a lot from you along the way, and I appreciate your advice, man, and the gems you drop. You know what I'm saying? Because, you know, honestly, you know what I'm saying? <clears throat> if you don't reach back, it dies with you. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a checks and balances, man. Yeah, we all, we all got to live. This is, you know, you, this is how you survive. You survive from your information. You survive from the things that you can do in the relationships and the work you put in. But at the same time, it's a blessing to be able to pass that along as well. You know, so, all right. I, I well, appreciate you, bro. Thanks for reaching out. Yes, sir, man. Well, you end up, you have a good night. I'm going to go ahead and end this live. Everybody that tuned in tonight, thank you for listening. You know, smooth conversations. All right. Good night. Good night. Peace out, bro. Peace.